Our first presenter this morning is Tim Hurchens from MX3D. Uh, Tim is here to share his thoughts on the future of digital fabrication, including the use of robotics to print metal objects. So ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together. Welcome to the stage, Tim Hurchens. Thanks, thanks for that uh, introduction. So um, yeah, I'd like to tell you a little bit today about uh, MX3D, how we became a startup, a technology startup, how we came into the world of 3D printing and ultimately came up with the idea to print a steel bridge, a crazy idea to print a steel bridge in Amsterdam. But before I start, I want to show you a quick video that I uh, always like to show because it's, it's, it's a really inspirational video that really gets us all the time. So, of course, it's a, it's a fake viral video, but I, I, you know, the, the, the enthusiasm that comes from this video is really what I really like about it. It's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's you know, imagination, your imagination should be your only limitation, and uh, that's, that's what keeps us going all the time. So, <clears throat> to explain you a little bit what we do, what we, how we started, is we are a design company uh, based around George Laman, which uh, is a Dutch designer, and we do a lot of really high-tech projects. We, we, we make expensive furniture, basically, but uh, we, it, all, all the projects we do are really experimental. We use high-tech materials, new techniques, and then we do all experiments. Some end up in pieces of furniture, other ones uh, just stay in the experimental phase. And an example of that is, uh, is this table you see here. It looks a little bit like a lightsaber that's cutting through a table, but actually this is an aluminium table we, uh, that we produced using digital fabrication, using uh, CNC milling. And Aluminium is kind of a soft material, and we really wanted a scratch-resistant surface, really hard scratch-resistant surface. So what that robot is doing is actually spraying a layer of tungsten carbide on top of the table. And tungsten carbide is a really scratch-resistant material. It's almost as hard as diamond, which also poses a problem, because if you have to um, mirror polish a really hard material that's almost as hard as diamond, you actually have to use diamond to polish it. So, so this, uh, we had to buy this machine in order to be able to finish this table and to highly polish it. Another good example of what we do is uh, this chair. It's, uh, it's already about 10, 11 years old. It's a chair based on how evolution could design a chair. So what we did was we used topology optimization software, which is software that's used in the car industry uh, to make car parts more lightweight. And we use that to actually uh, design a chair. So you take the design space of the chair, the basic space, you put forces on it that you would expect on a chair, and then you let the computer do the rest. Well, of course, then you end up with a rendering, which uh, uh, you can't sell. So we have to produce it. We had to produce it. And back then, there, there were no printers around, no 3D printers around that could print metal objects, or not, at least not in a commercial way. So what we did was we actually 3D printed the mold of the chair. So on the left you can see the mold. We cast aluminium in it and then uh, you get a very intricate, very complex chair. So as designers we kind of have a little bit of a love-hate relationship with 3D printing. We really like the idea of 3D printing. We, we, we like what you can do with it, but there's a lot of limitations to it actually. Uh, the, the, the consumer grade 3D printers, the printers that are affordable to buy, I, I think the, the current stage status is a little bit uh, like the dot matrix printer in the, in, the, in the 80s. You know, really noisy, probably you recognize this sound. Really noisy, just one material uh, or one color. It's very slow, but it's getting there. So what we did, you know, we are designers, so we, uh, we thought we have to do something with the shortcomings of the technique. And then we came up with this idea to 3D print a chair it was impossible, of course, in one piece because the print, printing building volume was too small. So we decided to uh, actually cut it up into jigsaw puzzle pieces. And we made this chair available online for free download. So everybody who has a 3D printer 
uh, at home, the printers you can buy for maybe three, four hundred uh, dollars, you can actually print a chair yourself for maybe 30, 40 dollars or euros worth of material. And this is actually a fab lab, I think it was in Spain, who asked their members to, to actually get a chair or print one of those pieces and then they added it together to make a functional chair. chair out of it. And another example of uh, 3D printing, this is actually a really cool machine. It's a machine that can print uh, aluminium uh, based on, uh, it's, it's powder based technology. So you have a powder bed and the laser is solidifying a layer of aluminium uh, each time. And you can make really intricate shapes, really the, the, the level of detail is amazing and it's, it's a brilliant machine. It only has a few downsides and one of them is the price. A machine like this will set you back about a, a, a million euros to buy. But even a bigger problem is what you can see already here and you can see better here. The building volume of the machine is, is this big, so you know, hardly big enough to make a chair out of it. So to make this chair we actually have to cut up the chair into 16 different pieces in order to fit them in six building volumes. So we, we thought, you know, we, we, we need a printer that can print full-size furniture for us. And we started discussing with 3D printing companies, quite large 3D printing companies, but all of them were not interested. So we decided to take matters into our own hands and uh, start developing it ourselves. So what we did was we bought uh, an old retired industrial robot from the car industry. And together with two students from, uh, from a university in Barcelona, we started working on you know, developing a large-scale 3D printer. And we came up with this machine. It's printing a two-component resin, really fast curing resin, uh, and, and, and it's mixing it in the tip of the, of the machine. And then you can actually print lines almost in mid-air. And we thought the technique was actually quite interesting because the main difference between a technique like this and uh, the, the, the existing 3D printers is that you use six axes of freedom rather than three axes of freedom. So, you know, instead of just printing inside a building volume, you can move outside of the building volume and can, you can print you know, objects of virtually unlimited in size. But we want to take it one step further. We, wanted, we thought, okay, this is, it's not really a nice material to print with. Maybe we can do the same trick with steel or with stainless steel or with basically any metal. So what we did was we took a MIG welding machine. It's, it's a, a specific welding technique, and we just started printing. We started welding and building up material. And uh, so that kind of, you know, you, when you connect that to a robot, you have a 3D printer. Uh, you can just make metal, metal objects, big metal objects. So we thought, Eureka, you know, we never have to work again. We're going to be rich, all of us. But unfortunately, uh, we found this patent of uh, 1925, I think it is, of Ralph Baker, who uh, patented exactly this, you know building up decorative objects with a uh, welding technique. But luckily Mr. Baker didn't have uh, robots, uh, let alone software, so there was still a lot for us to develop. <coughs> what we did was we started developing, we are not software developers, but we, we had to develop software because it wasn't around. We developed software that could actually slice up uh, 3D models into uh, tool paths and then send it to the robot and the robot could actually print it. And the vase you see here, it's a vase we actually printed. It's about this high, I think it weighs five, six kilograms. And from CAD model to final product, it took about five hours. So it takes about 20 minutes to shoot it to the robot and then the robot starts printing and it prints about uh, between one and two kilograms per hour. So that's really fast actually. So, you know, we, we, we started testing out with it a little bit, printing straight lines, uh, going a bit more complex, printing uh, curved lines, you know, playing around with it, making structures. Not everything went well. Um, you know, of course, you have to learn. The robot sometimes got, you know, disoriented. And, uh, and this is actually quite funny. We, uh, this happened many times. We, uh, <laughs> we burned a lot of brooms. We wanted to keep a tidy workspace, so get the broom uh, next to it, but uh, it, it kept, kept catching fire. But we're still there. I mean, this is all, this is the first, the first robot we had was, it was a really small cramped space that was, uh, um, uh, that the robot, that, that had like four engineers and, uh, and, and the robots are really small. But then, you know, we could print structures, so it was about time to actually print something useful um, with it. And this is actually an art piece, also for Joris Lahmann. We printed about seven of those. And what's interesting about it is that it's, 
you can print any, any, any one of those uh, completely unique. You don't have to print series anymore. That's the good thing about 3D printing, about digital fabrication. You, you, you send information to the robot and it starts printing. It doesn't matter how complex it is. But then, you know, as I said, you know, we were in, in, in a very small, cramped place, uh, sweaty, sweaty engineers, so we needed to scale up a little bit. So we moved to a, an old shipping wharf in Amsterdam, Amsterdam North, and we built up our uh, laboratory there. And with that, you know, bigger space, so we, we wanted to think bigger. What else can we do with this technique? So we started to look uh, at, at um, infrastructure, architecture, and so on. And then actually, we were invited by one of our partners, uh, Autodesk, to San Francisco to their, uh, to their uh, office. And the night before we had a meeting, we thought we need to come up with something really cool, something that's really going to blow their minds. Uh, and, and, you know, we were sitting in the, in the garden of our uh, Airbnb place. And then we, you know, suddenly the idea came, we are from Amsterdam. Amsterdam is known for more than 1,500 bridges and canals. It should be a bridge. We really have to print a bridge because making a bridge really shows that 3D printing is, is, is a useful technique. You know, you can, you can print... You have to be able to stand on top of a bridge, you, you know, it should be strong enough. So it instantly made sense to, 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 to do a bridge. And um, our friends were really enthusiastic from the beginning and we gave them a call later on, like, okay, how are we going to do this? And the idea, you know, started rising a little bit. So how do you do that? You know, what did, printing a bridge, crazy idea, of course. So uh, the idea was to start with two robots from each side of the water and actually work your way towards the center of the, of the canal. That was the idea, to, uh, to, to actually do it. So, besides the plan, you also need um, partners. So, you need to have assistance, uh, not just financially, but also knowledge, knowledge base. So, we started talking to a lot of companies to help us out, because we are just a uh, design company, so we don't know nothing about technology or not enough. So we, we you know, we kind of gathered a, a big group of, of really cool partners around us. Another thing you need is location. Where are you going to place a bridge like this? Uh, this is actually a video of the opening of our workspace. Uh, I think it was October 2015, and it was op opened by the uh, deputy mayor of Amsterdam. And uh, she, all she had to do was push a big red button. And uh, we, th we figured we have robots, so might as well use a robot to, <laughs> to uh, cut the ribbon and, and show the location where it's going to be. And actually, this, it's called Ouderzijds Achterburg. Well, it's quite hard to pronounce, but it's in the red light district uh, of Amsterdam. It's, it's, uh, for us, it, from the beginning, that was the, the perfect place to, to make a bridge like this. It's, it's the oldest canal of Amsterdam. Uh, it, it's also the most narrow canal in Amsterdam, so uh, you know, it's not too hard to, to print there. It's about 8 meters span, so it totally makes sense to do it there. The only thing is, it's very busy there. Uh, day and night, I don't, know, I don't know how many of you have been to uh, the red light district in Amsterdam, but it's, it's busy. Day and night, tourists, uh, all the time. Uh, so we couldn't print it on site. We, we had to uh, find another solution. And we are in a really big factory place now, uh, so might as well print it there. So right now, the idea is to print it in our location, and when it's done, we're going to ship it to the canal, the actual, actual canal. So, another thing you need is a practice. What we did was we, we did some other projects to kind of get the idea of, uh, you know, what it means to print big objects. This, for instance, is a, uh, we're working on that now. It's a bar shape, of, it's a cocoon-shaped bar for a museum in Miami. And this is uh, two projects, actually, the, the one on the left is a bicycle that the students from the TU in uh, Delft printed together with us. We gave them uh, two months' time with our engineers, with our technique, to, and to come up with a really cool ID. And actually, they had the idea to print a bicycle frame, which uh, was actually a functional uh, frame in the end. And on the right, you see a screen that's actually printed in bronze, because we found out that besides steel and stainless steel, we could also print bronze, aluminium, uh, even titanium, uh, copper, whatever material you can weld, you can also print. And the last thing you need is um, a design. What's cool about 3D printing, about digital fabrication, is, is as I already mentioned, the complexity is not an issue anymore. Uh, decoration has gone out of, the ar out of architecture in the last decades because it's too expensive to decorate. A, a guy, you know, a craftsman with a hammer and a, and a, and a chisel is, is, 
it's really expensive, but for a robot, it doesn't really matter anymore, you know? You, you just feed it information, you feed it data, and it'll start printing. So we looked also at the topology optimization software, the same as we used for the chair that I showed in the beginning. Started to play around with it a little bit. This is uh, an Autodesk software that we, we used also for uh, uh, optimization software. But in the end, the design was so complex that uh, the engineers that we were working with were not really confident that we could actually calculate it, that we could validate the strength of it. So we had to simplify it a little bit. So this is the, actually the, the ID for the design now. Um, we used a software that, that um, determines the tensile strength and the compression strength within the object. And the red lines are the uh, compression strength and the blue lines are tensile strength lines. And we kind of translated those into a design. We deliberately took an S shape uh, for the bridge because uh, that's, we, we wanted to make it a little bit harder on the software and then, then the software comes up with more interesting uh, solutions rather than when you do a straight bridge. So these are some images of the design. Uh, we actually haven't launched the design yet. We are uh, going to launch it uh, somewhere this, this month, at uh, this month, at the end of this month or beginning next month. But what we did do already is we started printing the bridge uh, recently. About two months ago we started, we thought we, let's, let's start printing the first two meters, see how it goes and take it from there. So um, this is an image of the, the, the assembled piece of bridge moved to our location. And what we're going to do now is we're going to place, we, we printed this one up from the, from the ground, just straight up. And what we do now is we place the robot uh, on, on the, the canal walls, that we, we remade the canal walls and then put the robot on top of it to see what, uh, you know, what it's, uh, if we can print actually standing on top of the bridge, which is working quite well now. And the planning now is for the, um, still if everything goes according to plan, we think we will finish the bridge somewhere in the beginning of 2018 and it will be placed somewhere halfway 2018 over the canal. So uh, when it's there, of course, uh, you're all invited to come and have a look at it. So that's it. Uh, if, if, I don't know if we have time for questions, but I'm happy to take some questions. Thanks. <laughs>